Thank you for joining today on Side by Side, as we're going to think about one of those quite challenging areas of Bible truth, the gospel, as we were talking about creation and fall and redemption and glory. Today we deal with a couple of those. We're looking at the fall, essentially, and the outcome of the fall, which is sin. And in this chapter, chapter 1, verse 18, and right through to part of chapter 2, verse uh, 16, Paul gives a reason for why God is judging people for their sin. It's not an easy section. In fact, most of the epistle to the Romans is quite a challenge for us, and you need to read it slowly, and you most likely need to just try and latch on to the main point. And if I was to say what I think is the main point here, I think that the main point is God giving a clear reason why he judges everyone as being in the wrong, in the wrong. That means you and I and everyone else in the world. You don't need a good news gospel unless there's already a bad news. And this is the bad news, I suppose, before the good news. Let me read you just the first few verses. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. And through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. They became, they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshipping the glorious ever-living God, they worshipped idols made to look like mere people, birds, animals and reptiles. So, God gave them over, or he abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. And as a result, they did these vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshipped and served the things God created, instead of the Creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. I would stop there in the reading just for a moment, but I, I would encourage you to read on yourself. In my own reading of this today, I, I read on through to the end of chapter 3, but that brings us into the section we're going to think about next week, which is looking at the moralist, uh, the person whose moral behaviour in their own eyes is sufficient for them to be acceptable to God, meaning they don't need Jesus. And so you can see this passage is talking about God being justly angry and judging people for their sin. Speaking about how people do some things. One is they suppress the truth by wickedness. That's a, a clear statement and very important because you cannot suppress something that is not pressing in on you. you know, that's why you push back on it. It's why you talk about pushback. And then it talks then about exchanging not just suppressing, but then exchanging. It says they exchanged the truth about God and they began to worship, instead of God, worship the things God made. They worship the things God has created. And the end result of this is they get, it's like a cycle, isn't it, nearly? It's like a, a downward cycle where they go down and down. And then it talks about God giving them over. He gives them over, which is God giving people what they choose. And the outcome of that, of course, is tragedy. I was listening yesterday to uh, one of those little podcasts. It was Desert Island Discs, and it was an old one. It was Dame Claire Birchinger, a nurse who had received the Florence Nightingale Medal for her bravery and contribution in serving in many countries of the world, serving the Red Cross. And she spoke at the end about how she had been brought up with a Christian background uh, but she had decided that she didn't want any God from the outside speaking into her life. And I thought that was an interesting way to put it. And it made me think of this passage. I don't want you speaking into my life. So instead of her just giving up her any, any notion of, 
a religious notion, but recognizing, I think, without saying it, that she is a spiritual person, as every human being has a spiritual dimension, made in the image of God. A friend said to her, well, you don't need to give up everything. Well, you could choose Buddhism because, you know, Buddhism's got many variations and you can find the one that suits you. And that's what she did. And here you see a good illustration of how people reject God, but allow what it says here, they think they're wise and they become foolish. Because the interesting thing is that Buddhism doesn't actually believe in God. (laughs) And so she has chosen a religion, a form of something. And it's so sad. So I I thought that was a good illustration of this type of thing in, in an individual who's who, who is living today. And then in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep, as happens to us all from time to time, well, it was one of those nights, and I was uh, decided I would read something that I know I had read before and thought this will maybe help us in this whole area. And it was C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity, in the very first chapter where he talks about the law of human nature. And I want to quote some of it to you this morning. And this is to give you some background so that when you read again this chapter one, I hope it'll make sense to you. C.S. Lewis says, everyone has heard people quarreling. Sometimes it sounds funny and sometimes it sounds merely unpleasant. But however it sounds I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kinds of things they say. They say things like this, How would you like it if everyone did the same to you? That's my seat. I was there first. Lead Maloney isn't doing you any harm. Why shouldn't you shove in first? Give me a bit of your orange. I give you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like that every day. Educated people as well as uneducated, children as well as grown-ups. What are they doing? They are appealing to some kind of standard behaviour, which they expect the other person will know about. And the other man very seldom says, and I'm quoting Lewis, to hell with your standard. I continue, it looks in fact very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of of fair play or decent behaviour or morality or whatever you like to call it, about which they agreed. Quarrelling means trying to show that the other man is wrong. And this is what he describes as the law of human nature. And it's a law that man could choose either to disobey or to obey. It's not like the other laws, like the laws of gravity. You can't choose it, that's just there. But this is one that you choose. And I quote again, but taking the race as a whole, they thought that the human idea of decent behaviour was obvious to everybody. Now I know, says Lewis, that some people say the idea of the law of nature or decent behaviour known to all men is unsound, because different civilizations and different ages have quite different moralities. But this is not true. There have been many differences between their moralities, but these have amounted never to anything like a total difference. In any, if anyone will take the trouble to compare the moral teaching of the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Hindus, Chinese, Greeks and Romans, what will really strike them is how very alike they are to each other and to our own. He continues, The most remarkable thing is this, whenever you find someone who says they do not believe in a real right and wrong, You will find the same person going back on this a moment later. They may break their promise to you, but see if you try breaking one to him, he'll be complaining. It's not fair before you can say Jack Robinson. A nation may say treaties don't matter, but then the next minute they spoil their case by saying that the particular treaty they want to break was an unfair one. And haven't we heard that recently? But if treaties don't matter... And if there's no such thing as right and wrong, in other words, if there's no law of nature, what's the difference between a fair treaty and an unfair one? So what Lewis is trying to do is saying, look, look, look around you, he says, you see this in everyday life. God is saying is there is a law written on your heart. Paul will say that a little later. And that is this impressing upon us the sense that we each of us have a responsibility. No one can say that, you know, it, it's not, it's nothing to do with me. That's why that the Bible says here in Romans, no one has an excuse. No one has an opt-out. 
So as you reread this again today, think about these things and maybe just play over again or even pick up your copy of C.S. Lewis' Mere Christianity and read the first three chapters in part one. They could be a tremendous help to you as I find they are to me. And God willing, we'll catch up next week as we continue through Romans. 